Right, folks, how are you doing? So let's wrap up Mars, Atlantis, and the Hollow Earth, Part 7. So the foundation of Care Troia. Hang on, let me just make sure I'm on the right one. Yep, yep, this is the right one. So the Merovingians were committed to the worship of Diana, one of the great goddess figures of the ancient world who was also known as Artemis. This was the same goddess worshipped in Atlantis. Paris and London are two of the most important global centres, and both were founded by bloodlines from Troy. The connection between the Britain and Troy goes way back, long before this bloodline became known as the Merovingians. It was a royal Trojan named Brutus, a relative of Helen of Troy, who sailed west to Britain after the fall of Troy and founded a city called Caer Troia, or New Troy, London. Offshoots of the Merovingian line left northern France and Belgium for Scotland in the 12th century to become famous Scottish aristocratic families. And check out On Unslaved. Um, I did a podcast about that when Scotland was Jewish. The uh, Sephardic uh, Norman families who came with William the Conqueror into uh, Scotland yeah, this was in two different phases. I haven't read when Scotland was Jewish for months now, but there was two different phases of them, of waves of migration. One of them came with William the Conqueror, and they were all Sephardic Jewish. Uh, interestingly, that ties into what I was saying before about uh, what Michael was saying about the tribes of Israel moving into um, moving into Europe after the fall of Jerusalem. Now that completely goes against what Beaumont's version of history is, but you know it is what it is. I mean, um, also uh, New Troy, according to Beaumont, was not actually London; it was Dunfermline, I think. I was working on a presentation about that yesterday, but well, that'll be coming out within the next few weeks. So, like I said at the end of the last one, you know, um, when it comes to Beaumont and Ike, they diverge at this point. Uh, and they go in totally different directions, but the Merovingians, either way, did have connections to the tribes of Israel, the lost tribes and the tribes of Judah and all the rest. Um, whether you believe Beaumont's version or you believe Ike's version, or indeed Tazarian's version, because I think his version is even slightly divergent from David Ike's version, even though uh, he has said numerous times, uh, Michael, on Unslaved, that he used to be a researcher for David Ike. So there you go. But yeah, these famous Scottish aristocratic families, uh, they're what I call um, uh, kind of Norman Sephardic, you know. Um, There's a kind of a mixture of those two different things. But yeah, we'll return to when Scotland is Jewish uh, in the future. A subject for another time. So the fleur de lis, busy little bees, the three pointed fleur de lis, formerly the Trident of Atlantis and Lemuria became the symbol of the Merovingian bloodline, and so you see it used profusely by British royalties and official, unofficial buildings and in churches. The bee is also a Merovingian symbol, and this was associated with Artemis and many other goddesses. The uh, Merovingians were supposed to have died out, but in reality, the genetics continued with the king of the Franks called. Uh, excuse me, called Charles, more famously known as Charlemagne. He vastly extended the Frankish domains and ruled as Emperor of the West, descending from the Roman Empire, what was just a recreation of it, essentially. Uh, these, in turn, descended from the royal lines of the Sumer Empire, who descended from Atlanteans, Lemurians, and the interbreeding of the Nordics with the reptilian Anunnaki. To my mind, the fleur de lis looks like um, the female reproductive system. You know, the ovaries, and then it goes down into the womb. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, you know, uh, this whole idea that uh, the powers that be and all this worship the goddess. Well, their symbol being the fleur de lis is a thinly veiled female reproductive system. That's what it looks like to my mind. And I couldn't resist putting in that image of uh, <laughs> one of the funniest moments in The Simpsons. Just to be a little bit more lighthearted, you know, because this is some pretty heavy stuff, but... Homer with a swear jar, <laughs> he's sleeping on the hammock. <laughs> he's this drops on him. <laughs> the next thing he's dropping all the money in the swear jar. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. It's so funny. 
Like Homer, I don't think you need to pay for that one. I think when a business drops on you and you get stung a million times, you you can make an exception for that. But you know, <laughs> oh, it's so hilarious. Now, there's no subtle reason or side reason why I put that image in. It just reminded me of that. Anyway, get back to this the serpent song. Sometimes you need a laugh in between all this heavy stuff, you know. Oh my dear. Anyway. <laughs> Another of the key names in Illuminati genealogy is Alexander the Great. Alexander carried the strongly Nordic DNA uh, and descended from the Viking peoples who settled the Mediterranean after the Atlantean cataclysms. Alexander ruled Troy, and his army had seized control of a vast region once ruled from Sumer. See how, what I mean as well, how uh, Beaumont and Ike are very divergent on this point. Very divergent no, at this point. This included Egypt, Mesopotamia, and into India. He founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt. He was the serpent son, and Alexandria was the city of the serpent son. Excuse me. The legend goes that Alexander's real father was the serpent god Amon. And this mirrors the story of Merovi, uh, founder of the Merovingian dynasty, a Swedish contact. Uh, had a long relationship with Russia's leading UFO expert. He had spoken of the Caucasus Mountains as an interdimensional portal through which other dimensional beings could enter the physical world. This region was also a place where bloodlines from the Middle and Near East intermingled and interbred with the Far East and Northern Russia and into Western Europe as well. I suggest I would go further than that, but you know, or maybe he did and I just edited it out. I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> endless bloodlines among us. Going back to the sky people, remember the very earliest presentations in the series of Mars, Atlantis, and the Hollow Earth were Brinsley, the portrait. I tend on going back to that. So Lemuria and Atlantis uh, was a time of widespread extraterrestrial and interdimensional activity on the planet, and many Earth races were seeded in that period. There are endless bloodlines among us, not just those of the Anunnaki reptilians, there has been a long battle in many parts of the galaxy between the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordics of Lyra, the Pleiades, Aldebaran, and elsewhere. It sounds like Aldebaran. And factions of a reptilian race based in the constellations of Draco and Orion and within the Sirius network. Some of the reptilians were driven out or forced underground by the Nordics. This battle on Earth is symbolized by stories such as St. George defeating the dragon and St. Patrick removing the snakes from Ireland. So it's all just symbolism in the end. It's all coded language. Brinsley Lepore Trench says in his book, The Sky People, that the crossbreeding between the serpent race and the white race began on Mars. Like I say, just check out the earlier parts of Mars, Atlantis, and the Hollow Earth. Crossbreeding took place there before they moved to Earth. The reptilians have followed the Nordics around the galaxy for eons because the blood of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people is very important to them. Uh, interesting. I wonder why that is. I'm not blonde or blue-eyed myself. You can clearly see that. But my mother is. So I've got a bit of this uh, reptilian Nordic blood myself. You know, and uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, a lot of this also is covered by Lou Bolden. Um, you have to wonder if David Icke ever read Lou Bolden's stuff or not. You have to wonder behind the scenes how much all these different authors read each other's work and meet each other and all this. I don't know, because there's a lot of, you know, crossover between them. That might be by accident or maybe not. Who knows? Our Haunted Planet, John A. Keel. This is a great book, by the way. Also highlighted the blue blonde theme in Our Haunted Planet. According to the traditions of uh, many isolated peoples, the first great Emperors in Asia were god kings who came down from the sky, displayed amazing superhuman abilities, and took over. Well, I suggest it's really just technology, but you know. Uh, there was a veritable worldwide epidemic of these god kings between 5000 and 1000 BC. There was even allusions to it in Star Trek, you know, with Space Seed and the Wrath of Khan and all that. It's kind of along similar lines, isn't it, when you think about it, except for the whole blonde thing and blue eyes. The myths and legends of Greece, India, and South America describe their rule. They were taller and more imposing than the men of the time, again, the whole thing with giants, with long blonde hair, marble-like, white skin, and remarkable powers. 
well, it was probably just technology, which enabled them to perform miracles. Oh, they just had better medicine. The ancients said that they had marble-like white skin, and the modern pilot describes these beings as having pearl-like skin. Again, this whole thing of really, really white skin. Not like white people, but like really white. Like albinos, almost. There are many modern reports of such beings living within mountains, including Mount Shasta in California, where Lemurians fled before the cataclysms. The ancient book of Enoch describes the watchers, and there appeared to me two men, and this is a quote, very tall, such as I have never seen on earth, and their faces shone like the sun, and their eyes were like burning lamps. Their hands were brighter than snow. This all ties into the hollow earth. Some ancient gods were also called the shining ones. A theme of, mo so like I say, not just white people, but beyond that, like really, really white and shining and all this. A modern, sorry, a theme of modern extraterrestrial research is that the Pleiades star system, the Seven Sisters, is peopled by a blonde, blue-eyed race and a reptilian one. And once again, a reverence for the Pleiades can be found throughout the Sumer Empire and beyond. The Pleiades is a grouping of some 200 stars. Some suggest that Alcyone, the brightest star of the Pleiades, is the pivotal center of this part of the galaxy. Cherokee and Maya legend in North and Central America and the Greek historians Apollodorus and Diodorus are among those who refer to Pleiades visiting Atlantis. Well, exactly. Interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> so tall blonde beings. The Greeks said that Pleiadians had mated with Poseidon, a king of Atlantis, and the offspring populated that society. Diodorus said that two of the seven symbolic sisters of the Pleiades, Cilione and Alcyon, had laid with uh, the most renowned heroes and gods, and thus became the first ancestors of the larger portion of the race of human beings. The LiDAR constellation is widely associated in UFO research, uh, and the stories of abductees with a blonde-haired, blue-eyed race, Aldebaran, a giant red star, is another Nordic-related location, and the constellation of Taurus. Many abductees tell of loving experiences with tall, blonde beings claiming to come from the Pleiades, as they do with some reptilian experiences. I am not suggesting for a moment that all of these Nordics or reptilians have a malevolent agenda for humanity. Some will have a positive agenda, some neutral and others control. And the image on the right is from an episode of The Outer Limits. Can't remember the name of it. Um, what was it called again? But yeah, when I remember it, I'll uh, put it into the description below to check it out. I think you can still get it on YouTube, possibly. Um, but yeah, the idea of these benevolent, blonde, blue-eyed beings coming to, you know, help out humanity in some ways, uh, in small ways, and other times, you know, in big ways, you know. But yeah, that was an image taken from uh, The Outer Limits. That's an example in that show of exactly what we're talking about here. You know, um, the blonde, uh, blue eyes having a loving experience with normal, flawed human beings, in a way. And I've also got books about that over there as well. Um, people who were abducted you know, uh, mating with these blonde, blue-eyed uh, aliens, which sounds a bit like something out of a bad porno, but, you know, apparently these things have really happened. Between Dimensions. Researcher Franz Kamp believes that the more positively motivated Nordic extraterrestrials fled from Atlantis to the Himalayas and have operated from there ever since. Certainly there are many legends in that region of the world of tall, blue-eyed, blonde-haired supermen living under the ground or within mountains. Some beings know how to change their frequency range and dip between these dimensions, appearing and disappearing, like in, you know, they live on the right. Excuse me, where was I? Where was I? Yeah, this is why people have reported seeing entities disappear before their eyes. There are people who suggest that, in fact, Atlantis and Lemuria were not third-density realities, but fourth-density, and that as a result of what happened, the frequency fell and everything became denser. Maybe. 
It could also be to do with the wars of the planets and all this sort of thing, and the destruction of Mars. I wouldn't count it out. The fall of man, they say, was the fall of the frequency of the planet from the fourth to the third density as a result of the fantastic events that destroyed Mars and almost destroyed the Earth. Well, yeah, like I just said, and he got Roddy Piper on the right hand side, you know, blonde, blue eyed, wearing the glasses, and he can see between the frequencies with it. If you've never seen the LF, recommend it. So, the royal bloodlines. Franz Camp, the Dutch researcher, began his journey of discovery after his marriage to a reptoid hybrid woman ended after 12 and a half years. How did he go 12 and a half years without noticing that she wasn't human? Anyway, uh, they were peaceful and had blonde, uh, sorry, had blue eyes and white blondish hair. Reminds me of, you know, the Targaryens and Game of Thrones and uh, the Lannisters and all this. Um, by mixing up their DNA with the reptiles, as naive as they were, the humanoids' character changed and they got reptile qualities of character. This was the fall of the human without controlling the breeding process. The reptiles know the humanoid will prevail. They feel inferior to humans, apparently. There are many ancient stories that indicate the existence of underground cloning laboratories. Again, Hollow Earth. The Nordics were one of the key extraterrestrial races involved with Lemuria and Atlantis. And there are many stories that they went to war with the reptilians and forced them underground. The reptilians have been working ever since to regain control of the planet and interbreeding with the royal bloodlines of the Nordics was the most effective means of doing so. Or doing this even. And on the top right you've got Attack of the Clones in Star Wars with blonde blue-eyed Obi-Wan Kenobi visiting this vast cloning planet which is on the water with these stand-ins for the greys. You know, um, they're breeding this clone army. And on the bottom right, you've got uh, Kirk, Captain Kirk, fighting some kind of reptilian creature. I've never seen that episode, by the way, of the original series. But I should go watch it, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the whole idea of cloning, even in mainstream movies like Star Wars, you know, the war amongst the stars, you know, you've got the greys turning around, the Jedi Master, you know. Uh, what was it? The Jedi were like the ancient priestcraft, the magicians in ancient Egypt. All this sort of thing. No, it was spelt slightly different. There's loads of stuff about that online. You can look it up. So the Pen Dragon, the Great Dragon, the Book of Di how do you say this? The Book of Zion, I think, tells of how a reptilian race it calls the Sarpa or Great Dragons come from the skies to bring civilization to the world. Deluge into the Golden Age, it says, wiped out a race of giants, Nordics. But the serpent gods survived and returned to rule. They are described as having the face of a human, but the tail of a dragon. Interestingly, when you watch the movie Lord of War, I think there's a, a part where Nicolas Cage talks about, was it four and a half weeks or four and a half months, a human fetus has a tail, uh, which is a leftover of our evolution. You know, go watch Lord of War, not a good movie. You know, pay attention to the dialogue in these films. They are telling you the story. I think it's four and a half months. Uh, human embryos have a tail. So there you go. Their leader was called the Great Dragon, and this is the origin of Pendragon or Great Dragon in ancient uh, in ancient Britain. James can't talk today. James Churchwards. There we go. Research says that the Nagas came from Lemuria. We've seen this before. The Nagas were said to have a close connection to water and entered their underground centers through wells, lakes, and rivers. The same in China of the Long Wang or Dragon Kings, who were described as part human, part serpent. However, the two Indian epics also refer to how the reptilian Nagas intermingled with the white peoples and interbred to produce a reptilian mammal hybrid, the Aryan Kings. And this whole thing of water as well, as mentioned earlier, the Kana Missing Project and uh, Missing 411 and Dave Politis. You know, as well as uh, granite boulder fields and granite, he talks about bodies of water. People go missing near bodies of water all the time. It happens way more frequently than people know about in national parks. Like, um, oh, what was the one that was really bad? I'm blanking on it now. But all the national parks, you should really pay attention to that are forested areas, you know, bodies of water and boulders and granite. Um, can't remember. 
what was it called? The big national park. What was it? Uh, Yosemite. Yosemite. That one's notorious for people just up and disappearing like that. And sometimes they never find any trace of them. They bring in the dogs. They find nothing. Sometimes they show up hundreds of miles away. Honestly, look it up. The Canada Missing Project. You know, especially if you're into hiking and things like that. Uh, so up on the top left, you've got Jon Snow with Drogon, you know, in uh, Game of Thrones. And Jon Snow is Ice and Fire, you know, the Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, the books are way superior to the TV show, by the way. I've got, I think, almost all the books over there. There's only one, I think, that I haven't got, and that's Dance of the Dragon, uh, funnily enough. But yeah, the books are way better than the show. And, you know, there's a mixture of being descended from the first men which Beaumont talks about in uh, Britain, the hero world history and the great deception and the brittle uh, and the brittle, <laughs> sorry, the riddle of prehistoric written. Um, trying to say two things at once there, but yeah, you got Jon Snow. He's the mixture of the, the wolf and the dragon, you know, ice and fire, you know, and Drogon, the big dragon recognizes that he's got that special bloodline, that he's the true king and all this. And then on the bottom left, you got the, the, you know, this kind of statue of a dragon emerging from the water, you know, and things like this. Honestly, you look into the, the Missing 411 stuff, and uh, I've got all three of the movies, by the way, that were made by Dave Politis. Very interesting. There's Missing 411, Missing 411, The Hunted, and there's Missing 411, The UFO Connection. I've seen all three of them on YouTube, but I bought them all. Very interesting when you start going into all that. So the Naga are the serpent gods. These are the divine royal bloodlines in media. Now Turkey, the Iranians knew the kings as Mar, which means snake in Persian, or Mars equals snakes. They were called the descendants of the dragon, the Naga Maya, with their mother goddess religion, were also the origin of the Maya people of Mexico. Researcher Michael Mott writes in Caverns, cauldrons and concealed creatures got that book over there the nagas are described as a very advanced uh, race or species with a disdain for human beings well i kind of thought that when all the people said i couldn't miss near bodies of water in boulder fields i don't think you know that they're our friends but anyway uh, the naga race is related to hindu demons or rakshasas or rakshasas however you say it, the theme of ruling royal families and emperors claiming descent and their right to rule from the serpent gods can be found across the ancient world. Hindu legend says that the Nagas could take a human or reptilian, or reptilian form at will. So again, all over the world you've got this. The similar types of pyramids in Indonesia and Mexico and Egypt and these serpent carvings, you know, uh, Balinese and Mayan, you know, um, I think I also made a, a video about this once as well, like uh, about Bigfoot. I'll uh, link that in the description below, you know, and um, the hollow earth I've touched upon before in the past as well. Like how um, there's the passage from Lou Baldwin's book, Mars and the Lost Planet Man, that kind of ties into Bigfoot and all the rest of it. I'll link that below so you can go check out that previous video I made. So the serpent symbolism, uh, quite a total once again. So across India, the rulers claimed power because they descended from the Nagas. Buddha is claimed to have been on the royal line of the Nagas. One of them he called Huang Ti, was said to have been born with a dragon-like countenance, whatever that means. It was claimed that he was conceived by a ray of golden light from the Big Dipper constellation. The Big Dipper includes the star Alpha Draconis, the star of Set in Egypt. Alpha Draconis is an alleged base of the Draco reptilian royalty. One Chinese legend says that when he died, Huang Ting transformed into an etheric dragon and flew to the realm of the immortals. The earliest of the royal bloodlines of Central America claimed descent from Quetzalcoatl. In the Mycenaean age in Greece, the kings were quote, regarded as being in some sense a snake. Uh, Cesrops, the first Mycenaean king of Athens, was depicted as a human with a serpent tail. 
the symbolism of the serpent can be found on every continent. So you can see it here on the right hand side, the constellation of the bear and the, what appears to be like a dragon. And uh, yeah, the lovely, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that's uh, Quetzalcoatl eating a human being. <laughs> nice guys, right? And I also remember in um, the books, and I'm sure it's in one of the episodes of Game of Thrones when Jamie Lannister, I think it's when he opens up to um, Brienne when they're in the bath after he's had his hand chopped off. He talks about the Mad King wanting to set on, you know, King's Landing on fire with all these caches of wildfire. Uh, you know, Jamie didn't commit this action because he was dishonorable or an oath breaker. Well, he was, was an oath breaker technically, but the reason why he did it, you know, was because the Mad King was going to burn down the whole city and uh, being descended of the, the dragon and his madness and his insanity, he thought that when he set the, the city on fire, he would be reborn as a dragon. You know, when you look in the, the Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon and all this, you know, I'm convinced that the writers of these shows, you know, know their stuff when it comes to mythology and legends and all this sort of thing. And a lot of what they're writing is based upon that to some extent, you know. Um, it's interesting, you know, just look it up. I'm sure you can get it on YouTube. Um, Jamie Lannister confessing to Brienne when they're in the bath. Uh, you know, his real reasons for killing the Mad King was because he was completely off his fucking head. He was going to kill everybody in the whole city and just burn the whole thing down rather than admit defeat him. He was going to transform it into this big dragon himself in his head. You know, that's what he thought. But yeah, you know, the whole dragon connection is definitely present. You know, but uh, not much more to say, really. Thank you very much for watching hope you got something out of this and feel free to leave your thoughts and comments below and we'll wrap it all up with part eight coming quite soon so take care